I'm breathing underwater, I'm weightless through space. I'm soaring like an eagle all over this place. Creatures most will never see are waiting there to look at me. And all I got to do is breathe underwater. The year is 1962. Irwin Allen is a big name as a movie producer and director, and his most recent project was about an advanced nuclear submarine that has to save the world from a catastrophe. The film was successful, and before Irwin knew it, audiences wanted to see more of the Sea View. Since they already had all the sets, props, models, and everything else just lying around, he decided to make a series out of it. I'm not sure even he could have anticipated how well it was received, and it became the longest-running science fiction show on television at the time. Original stars Walter Pigeon and Robert Sterling had moved on to other projects and weren't available, so we had to go with different actors. But the character names and jobs were the same, and then there was the sub. This is the Sea View, the most extraordinary submarine in all the seven seas. Its public image is that of an instrument of marine research. In actuality, it is the mightiest weapon afloat. I don't know what her problem is. Suddenly she doesn't like her chair today. That sub became so iconic, Irwin used the model in some of his other shows when he needed a sub. And there's something I always wondered. What does this thing tell them? It looks like the light show for their next dance party. In command of the Sea View, Captain John Phillips. And an overall charge of scientific projects, the creator and builder of the fabulous ship, Admiral Harriman Nelson. After his hitch with the Sea View, John Phillips retired from government work and went on to found a successful 60s rock group. Admiral Nelson is putting an urgent call through to the Pentagon for what we don't know yet. This is the Sea View's top secret submarine base. It is carved out of solid rock and is located on the Southern California coast, 500 feet beneath the famed Nelson Institute of Marine Research. At the moment, there isn't much going on there. Everybody's waiting for their next assignment. The Admiral and the Captain are getting into that car to go get it now. Why do I get the feeling that's not a fashion statement? We'll watch the two motorcycles get taken out, and then our gunman will focus on the car. <laughs> William Hudson played Captain Phillips, and I find myself wondering if that was the shortest job he ever had. That was Admiral Nelson who jumped out of the car, so our shooter will have to finish the job. Or not. If we can find his carcass, maybe we can get some answers. Never mind. Good luck finding him in that. That takes us to the opening credits, and once we come out of the first commercial break, we're met with this. Did I say we're met with that? I meant we're smacked in the face with it. Where is all that happening? It isn't yet. It's a taste of what's coming if the Sea View can't find a way to stop it. In exactly 11 days, two earthquakes will occur in the Arctic. Now, the first will be moderate, but the second, following in a matter of hours, will generate enormous tidal waves, as Dr. Wilson will describe. These towering waves will roar down through the Bering Straits inundate Hawaii and go on to strike the west coast of America a smashing blow. Granted, it'll also devastate the eastern coasts of Russia and China and probably completely inundate Japan, but we know what part of the world really matters. 
Dr. Selby got tired of being a seismologist and went back to school. When he was done, he became part of some kind of weird project out in the desert. Supposedly, it has something to do with time travel, as if anybody's going to buy a story like that. And in the other half of the world, they will sweep down here, smash the British Isles, Western Europe, and go on to demolish our own East Coast. Again, it'll also wipe out most of Western Africa, but it's not like that's important. We're talking the imminent destruction of a lot of white people here, gentlemen. We cannot allow that. This far down the line, I can really see the subtle Cold War propaganda at work here. Destroying the U.S. and Western Europe is a disaster because if the West is destroyed, who's going to keep those lousy commies in check? We've got 11 days. I say evacuate all the threatened areas. Oh, impossible. If news of this impending disaster reaches the public, it could touch off a worldwide panic. And even if we avoided that, evacuation would mean trying to move nearly a billion people. Not to mention, where would you put them? Relocation on that kind of scale is physically impossible within that time frame. So the world is hosed, right? There's no other alternative. But there is, General. We can adopt Admiral Nelson's plan. Do I even need to introduce Eddie Albert? He was an established character actor for decades, but then he achieved his immortality as Oliver Wendell Douglas, the New York attorney who gave it all up to be a farmer in Hooterville. Between Green Acres and its sister show Petticoat Junction, he and Ava Gabor became household names and remain so to this day. And I have to admit, I like him much better with the lawyer haircut than the military brush cut. That just doesn't look right on the same guy who bought the Haney place. The Haney place? <laughs> I propose to detonate a nuclear device near the North Pole at the exact instant of the second quake. That's too risky. The explosion could double the force of the tidal waves. Oh, just the opposite, Doctor. The explosion will set up opposing lines of force, breaking the backs of the tidal waves before they form. The only way to stop a disaster that could destroy most of humanity is with a nuclear explosion. This sounds vaguely familiar, and it has the same issues. What the Admiral just said is true, at least in theory. An equal and opposite force going against the first one has the potential for the two events to cancel each other out. Which is to say the plan can work. My question? Yes, the portion of the nuclear explosion that goes north will cancel out the earthquakes. What about the part of the explosion that goes all the other directions? How do we deal with that? We didn't get an answer in the movie, and we won't get one now. My educated guess for what it's worth is, we're assuming the detonation will happen far enough away from any inhabited areas that it'll wear itself out before it reaches any human settlements. How long will the North Pole be radioactive? We won't address that either. But it's likely there will be enough radiation from this explosion that Santa, his reindeer, and his sleigh will all be glowing in the dark so Rudolph will find himself on the unemployment line. Nobody ever considers what these operations will cost in terms of jobs. Your plan seems to be based on wishful thinking. You think so, General? May I remind you, on my way to this meeting, Captain Phillips and four of my best men were shot down in cold blood by agents of an enemy power with which we're all too familiar. This was their desperate attempt to stop Operation Counterforce. They didn't think it was wishful thinking. But what do they gain from a tidal wave Armageddon? They want to see widespread disaster and death. They want to see all governments crippled because this will bring them closer to their ultimate goal, world domination. Ah, yes, world domination. It's been the goal of many, many people throughout human history. Somewhere near the beginning, it was about resources and who controlled them. But before long, it became an ego trip for whoever was doing it. The thing is, lots of people have conquered the world, or as much of it as they knew about. And right on down the line, nobody could figure out the best thing to do with it once they controlled it. That's why every empire has fallen, and everyone that arises after us will also fall, because there's no reason for such a thing to exist. What's the point of having control over millions of other people? What do you do with them? What do you want from them? What makes you think they want you to rule over them? From Alexander to Genghis Khan to Napoleon and right on down the line, I've never seen an answer to those questions. We conquer each other because that's what we do. 
but there's no law written down either on a writing surface or in our DNA that says we have to. Will we ever get past it? I doubt it. There will always be some clown out there who's afraid his dingle dangle is too small, so he has to push other people around to prove to himself that he's a man. At least today, there's the potential to distract him with Viagra. That's progress. Well, Admiral, it's a darn shame about Phillips, wasn't it? He's a good man. The best. I don't know what I'm going to do for a replacement. I do. I've requisitioned the Navy's best submarine officer for you. You know anything about a commander named Crane? Lee Crane? Of course. A fine officer. He served with me on the old Nautilus. Lee Crane? Of course I know him. He served with me in the film. You know that. Dr. Wilson says he's heard that Crane is by the book, not much imagination. Admiral Nelson says, I'll take my chances. But he may or may not get the chance. It looks like there's trouble brewing at the Seaview's base. Whoever this guy is, if he's gotten this far, he can do a lot of damage. Dan Trump! Welcome aboard, Captain. Now he can do even more damage when he hands out disciplinary actions for letting him get that far. He is not a happy captain. Gentlemen, thank you for that warm welcome. But it wasn't warm enough. Your security should have stopped me before I came on board. From now on, the ship will remain on full alert. Carry on. Yes, sir. The fact that he reached the boat should get somebody a few days in the brig. The Admiral wants to discuss that. The check at the gate was very thorough. But I consider the crew aboard soft on security. Soft, Commander. I eluded the sentries, and I actually got aboard. You didn't get very far, did you? No, sir. I'll have to admit I didn't. That's why there are levels of security. You get past one, and the next one wraps you up like a birthday present, which is exactly what happened. Got a lot to learn about your crew, Commander. They're not regular Navy, but at the same time, don't think of them as some ragtag civilian outfit. They're highly skilled experts, every one of them. And they can function equally well in many fields. Is that understood? Yes, sir. While it's true that this sub has enough firepower on board to take on some small countries, it's first and foremost a research vessel. The crew has been chosen and trained with that in mind. Crane is your basic Navy guy who most often does follow the book. He's going to have to adjust his thinking to fit his new assignment. But right now, it's time to open their sealed orders. Any questions? No, sir. The orders are quite clear. To complete the mission, I'm to regard Seaview and her entire crew as expendable. If you have a choice, though, Captain, I assume you'll bring us all back alive. Well, I sort of planned on coming back myself, sir. If they don't, this is going to be a very short series. Uh, with your permission, Admiral, I'd like to announce the mission to the crew. Sorry, lad. The crew is to consider this a routine mission. Tell them course and destination, nothing else. Aye, sir. Confused, Lee? <sighs> Completely. In the Navy, I always tell my crew all mission details once we were safely at sea. I've never been in the Admiral's position, but honestly, I do not understand this mindset, even after he explains it. Lee, if the men discover even the slightest hint of the calamity threatening their families, this sub will be a floating pressure cooker. Not knowing they've only themselves to worry about. They're good men. They won't crack. Or it could spur them on to work even harder to complete the mission because they know what's at stake. For all his talk, the Admiral doesn't seem to have much faith in his crew. There's something else you should know. There's a certain powerful worldwide force which welcomes the very disaster we're trying to prevent. They seem to know our plans as soon as we do. I wonder how they do that. Oh, an admiral, a word of caution. They killed Phillips, but they were really gunning for you. And they still are. You be careful, my friend. 
Be careful. They killed Phillips, but they were really gunning for you. And they still are. You be careful, my friend. Be careful. Maybe like that? Whatever security swept that room did a lousy job of it. We watched the sea view dive and head away at full speed, which has the crew thoroughly confused. We also watched the bad guys tracking its progress. It's still a matter of triangulation involving our computers. As for the bomb unloading, that's been anticipated. Floats will handle it. What's that? I don't know. Depth charge attack. Rig for depth charges. A plane is making passes back and forth, dropping depth charges in a grid pattern. They'll have to run down and sit on the bottom to ride it out. Captain, what the devil is going on? You'll have to tell them something now, lad. Make it as little as possible. If I'm Captain Crane, I'm handing that microphone to the Admiral and saying, this is your baby, you tell them. He tells them that they're on a secret mission, there are forces out to stop them, and as far as they're concerned, the Sea View is now at war. Granted, we already learned that they don't have any offensive weapons capability at the moment, but at least they can outrun their foes. Hey, Sonar has a problem. Keeps getting intermittent readings. All stop! All stop! Sonar completely dead. Or not. Unlike the movie, the Admiral won't force them to travel blind. That sound they heard was most likely the sonar mast breaking off and sliding down to the ocean floor. That could mean the mission is a failure. What's he doing to us? I tell you, that guy's kicked his compass. Now get off, Kowalski. The skipper knows what he's doing. Yeah, well, I don't. Somebody's shooting at us, and they're not kidding. You heard him. We're in a top secret mission. <laughs> I don't recall volunteering. Did you? You're assigned to duty on this boat. That means you automatically volunteered for whatever missions it goes on. You knew that going in. Kowalski there was one of the first guys to grab Captain Crane when he snuck aboard. And Crane, who was a former boxing champion, decked him good. I think that shot to the jaw must have rattled his synapses a bit. If that scraping sound was the mass tearing loose, it must be somewhere nearby. I don't see how that helps us. I can put a party of divers out. If they can find the gear, we can surface and repair the damage within an hour. They're sitting on the bottom at a thousand feet. Diving gear would implode the moment you exposed it to that much pressure. But this is no ordinary diving gear. It would be easy just to say those tanks are reinforced to take the pressure of 30 atmospheres, but the tanks aren't the biggest implosion danger. The masks are. The instant they hit that much pressure, that glass would implode right into the men's eyes, and it would do it with enough force to drive the glass fragments back into their brains and kill them. But trust me, it's going to get even more frustrating. If these underwater sequences look familiar, they should. There is not a single original frame here. It's lifted wholesale from the movie. The only difference is we're showing it in black and white this time instead of color. Yes, we even grabbed that guy. And that guy. We'll repeat the whole sequence with the other guys rescuing him from the squid and all the rest. And the biggest change is this time we'll stick a commercial break in the middle of it. Despite all the contrary critters, eventually they'll get back to the sea view. How do you feel, lad? Like a sore loser. I do mean sore. Mission accomplished, gentlemen. 
They surface, repair the sonar, and get back underway. This time there won't be any giant octopus trying to eat them, which is the best news they've heard all day. They reach the polar ice without incident. The problem now is finding a clear place to surface so they can deploy the bomb. Captain, unidentified fast propellers bearing 090, short scale pinging. So, they don't give up easily, do they? Open fire at once. Now we're going to repeat the sub chase that we saw in the movie. Again, it's lifted without alteration from there and stuck in here. We changed the cut in so our new Admiral and Dr. Wilson are the observers, but everything else is straight out of the movie. Including this, though I do like the expansions that explain a few things. They're still diving. Don't let them get away. Follow them down. Close in for the kill. We're below 3,000. We can't take any more depth. They must not escape. Destroy them. We can't go any deeper. Tell him his orders are clear. They're clear, but they're insane. But your typical henchman is more afraid of the boss than he is of being reduced to the size of a marble. I don't know if this guy thought they could keep the sub intact by sheer force of will or what he was thinking, but even a mysterious evil leader can't overcome the laws of physics. Only the scuba gear they keep on the sea view can do that. That was too close for comfort. Captain, clear patch water, dead ahead. We still have a chance. Mr. Martin, take her up. All ahead full. They surface, unload a snow cat and a sled, and get Wilson going with the bomb. Activate drone 4C. Operations confirm. Activate drone 4C. Resume attack. I suggest they hurry. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's as much hurry as a snowcat can muster. It'll have to be enough. And now let's see probably the most remarkable aspect of this whole mission. 12 seconds to the first quake, Ed. 10 seconds. 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Yep, the most remarkable aspect of this whole mission is how we can predict an earthquake right down to the second. Somewhere between 1962 and today, we lost the ability to do that. Whatever happened to it? Metal stations, metal stations. Radar fleet is 7 o'clock low. Closing fast. Wilson, do you hear that? Take cover. We're under attack. Play coming. Hit the door. The attack will bury the snowcat in huge chunks of ice, but the bomb is intact. Wilson is hurt, but he can still do the job. His companion Malone isn't so lucky, he's got a broken leg. That means he can't help dig the snowcat out. Doctor, listen. Second quake is due in exactly three hours and 44 minutes. Yeah, I'm setting the timer now. His plan is to set the timer and then he and Malone will sit down and wait for the bomb to go off. There's no way he can dig the snowcat out by himself, much less do that and get back to the sub on time. Turns out this was a suicide mission, but he's okay making the sacrifice as long as the plan works. We don't know what Malone thinks of that. You better get the sub out of here. So long, Admiral. We've got 44 minutes, sir. If I can find them and then cover the snowcat, I could bring them back in time. And if you can't dig it out, then you've got no choice, sir. Pull the plug and scramble. We can't leave Eddie Albert out there to get blown up. He has to go back to New York and marry the only one of the Gabor sisters who actually knew how to act. Crane and the chief will head out to find him and bring him back alive. Detection gear reports the polar cap nuclear device's survivor attack. Impossible. Recheck the reading. They've been rechecked, sir. The device has definitely been triggered for detonation. Recall the drone. 
will attack again. And the way it's been going, you'll miss again. But you're definitely making a nuisance of yourself. Wilson, this is Crane. Can you read me, Wilson? Come in. I can barely hear you. Where are you? Wilson, I'm going to fire a flare. Tell me where you see it. That gets them where they need to go. Now let's get this snowcat dug out and get back to the sub. Sir, damage control reports the missile firing system's finally repaired. It doesn't help us much now, does it? Sir, it's five minutes past diving time. If we dive, they're dead. If we don't, everyone's dead. Take her down, Mr. Morton. Aye, sir. That drone will change their plans. Okay, that perspective gave me goosebumps. Well done, Erwin. Clear the deck. Prepare to dive. Delay that. There they are. Wilson insists they waited too long, they shouldn't have come to find him, and they're still in the blast radius, blah, blah, blah. But done is done unless he wants them to put him back out there. Now all hands, brace yourselves. Five, four, three, two, one. Seems like we've seen those consoles do that before, but we're not done reusing footage from the movie. Yes, we're still stuck with Irwin Allen's patented sinking ice. While that's happening, let's check in on our bad guys. Despite our every effort, Nelson and his submarine have accomplished their mission. An unforgivable blunder has been made. We have overestimated ourselves and underestimated the power of our adversary. Let's see, you lost the guy in the helicopter when the Admiral shot him, you lost that drone, as well as the useless bomb it dropped, and you achieved not a blasted thing. Maybe you're in the wrong line of work. We'll wrap up with Admiral Nelson offering Crane permanent command of the Sea View, and of course he'll say no and the show will be cancelled. Even with all the reused footage, not to mention this is basically a paraphrase of the plot of the movie, we got off to a good start. Our two main characters are well established, as is their working relationship. Crane has pretty well fooled everybody by being both creative and courageous. He doesn't ask any man to do anything he won't do himself. We can see that the crew have already come to respect him, especially after the way he saved Wilson and Malone. Wilson is okay, but Malone is one of them. Saving him got the captain major brownie points with the men. From now on, they're with him. We also established a formidable adversary. This operation has the resources to do most anything they want to, and right now the Sea View, Admiral Nelson, and Captain Crane are the biggest obstacles to their plans. Neither side is done with the other, and we're not done with them either. This show is going to hold our attention for a long, long time. So settle in, we have a lot of ground to cover, and this is going to be fun. I hope you'll join us for the ride. I'm breathing underwater, I'm weightless through space I'm soaring like an eagle all over this place Creatures most will never see are waiting there to look at me And all I gotta do is breathe underwater And his most recent project was it about... Yeah, 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 yeah. The year is 1962 Turn the air conditioner off Erwin Allen is a big name as a movie producer and director. The movie producer, okay. More of the Sea View. Since they... Had to go with different actors. Put the microphone up. Off to a great start here, David. We're talking the imminence... I hope you'll enjoy us. Gah! Join us!
Jeez. <coughs> so good at blowing the last line, aren't you, Irving? It's all your fault for not being here. 